Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, get ready to discover the wild side of China. Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Brad Josephs. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Brad. Hey, thank you so much, Rob. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, this is something that I've been <clears throat> excited about doing for uh, since 2019, which has um, announced that we are finally going back to China. And this is a, a trip that I absolutely love. I've uh, spent a lot of my, my career helping design this trip and explore these places. Um, really a very cutting edge expedition that I think is, uh, in my opinion, one of NatHab's greatest accomplishments really is to, uh, is to pioneer ecotourism in China. So um, so happy that, um, that we're, you know, we're beginning finally. So this is uh, definitely gonna be, well, this will be the first post-pandemic trip that we've done. And <clears throat> while uh, I do have to say that there's in inevitable when you do uh, a first trip after several years, I mean, things will have changed and we are going to face certain uh, unknown circumstances and figure things out like a puzzle, but that really is what I think is a true adventure. Um, I also was able to guide last summer the first post-pandemic trip to Borneo. And sure, there were some hiccups and, and, and things, you know, things weren't quite ironed out, but the, the euphoria of having uh, the locals that we work with and, and that we encounter along the way, see foreigners, foreign tourists come for the first time, um, it was just, it was, it was euphoric. I mean, I, and we just were like, we're, we're here again and uh, glad everybody survived. And we're just gonna go explore. So I believe that China, and I've traveled all over the world, I, I really believe that China is a, is a treasure chest of, of you know, mysteries and beautiful things that you guys, nobody, most of the Western world's never heard of. And the greatest scenery in the world, some of the, the greatest conservation, wildlife conservation story um, in history, and some of the most incredible cool wildlife. So we're just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna, I've already done a very similar webinar where I went into great detail about all of these issues. It was, uh, I did it in um, 2021 on this trip. And, but this one, uh, I think I'm gonna fly through it, just show the pictures, get a little bit of a recap and then save a lot of time at the end so that I can get specific questions because this is, uh, a, this is a, a webinar specifically designed as a know before you go, which is designed to prepare travelers um, who have already booked and are getting ready to go. So we have two destinations in October. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing that mostly usually draws people in to this trip is the, the keystone or the umbrella species the charismatic animal that 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 people want to go see to, off their bucket list that is the giant panda, which I believe is probably the world's most charismatic animal. Um, if you looked at everybody's opinion you know, on an average, something about their big, beautiful, dark coloring uh, on their eyes, and their demeanor, um, just their appearance, everything. It really draws people in, and that's mostly why people come to China. And that's great, and that's what that's going to be one of our main focuses, our, our giant pandas. However, the fun part is to show you guys everything else. I think the one of the themes is, I think to a bridge, maybe bridge some of the gaps between the United States and China. You know, they don't have anything to do with government politics, just the people. Our people going there to meet their people and that our people going to appreciate their nature. And I will say that China has a very, uh, is a certain reputation <clears throat> um, for, for problems with mother nature. But ironically, and this is something that I always wanna tell people, is that China is the, is, the, is the place where the greatest conservation story in world history ever occurred. And that was saving the giant panda from extinction. I've done an entire webinar, I, I think a couple even, um, just um, specifically talking about this, and we will learn about it on the trip. But that's the point: is we are we're going beyond and and looking at some of the things that are that are overlooked, and giving credit to the to the people 
in the places that you know have done amazing things. It's bringing the giant panda back from extinction. It's been a tremendous success. There's just no country in the world really that has devoted more resources, land, and, and, and finances to saving an animal. <clears throat> I remember back in what well, must have been about 2012, 13, when <clears throat> I was in China scouting out this trip in between doing a few trips and uh, had some downtime. And so I got, a, I got an email from the president, Ben Bressler, who <clears throat> said, hey, Brad, you know, you, I, I hear you're in China and you got some downtime. Can you please photograph some pandas for us? Because it's going to be, we need one for the cover of the catalog. Because <clears throat> that was the year that World Wildlife Fund uh, became the chief partner, <clears throat> travel partner with NatHab. And so it was just like a momentic thing. And, and so I spent several days trying to get the perfect panda image. And this was the one that was picked back in those days. So there's, th that, that's why this, this trip is very symbolic. And of course, the panda is the most symbolic animal for World Wildlife Fund as well. Because one of the reasons is because World Wildlife Fund is the was the first international basically organization that was invited by the Chinese government in the 1980s to save this species from extinction. And they can definitely deserve all credit for, for doing that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sometimes I'll have to, I might sound a little scratchy. I am getting over uh, some kind of a, a sickness that I got um, while I was traveling. Um, but yeah, so I've I'm dosed up on cold medicine and I hope I can communicate clearly to you guys um, and show all my passion. When one of the main things that I'm most passionate about with this trip is, is basically this trip, we were the first um, company to do any kind of ecotourism trips in China. And, and I was able to witness and help train and uh, influence the first naturalist career naturalist guides in China that that have learned how to specialize and cater to working with our clients, birds, plants, animals, culture, history, everything. So while there's no way I can ever become um, a master expert on everything China, but we have a team over there that is fantastic in the logistics and everything. I've never seen, of all the places I've guided, I've never seen a local team work so hard and so diligently to make our people happy and safe and leave with just a, a wonderful, wonderful feeling about, about an incredible place in the world. And so they're so proud of it and they, they want to show you the birds, the plants, the animals. And uh, yeah, and they're proud and they should be because it is a beautiful place. And yeah, this is the relationships we built. Um, they've been fantastic. And in our travelers, which generally not, not have travelers are you know, extremely friendly people. They appreciate nature. They, and then, and then, so they are great ambassadors um, for, for, for American people in China. So I think it's the wonderful thing is that when you guys go on this trip, you're, you're really doing something pretty special. So China is such an amazing place. And I think the the first thing to really that people don't realize or maybe never thought about was how big it is. Here's a here's an outline map of China on top of the of the United States, and so there are so many different like eco zones here. So from alpine to tropical jungle to the some of the harshest deserts in the world to boreal taiga, um, <clears throat> the highest mountains in the world, and just all wrapped up into this you know this huge chunk, and we're just going to be able to basically explore a tiny fraction of it. But in my opinion, after having been all over China, just the best fraction. We start our trip in Xi'an, which the history of Xi'an is amazing. My favorite part of the history of Xi'an really is the fact that it was at the, it was the, the start of the Silk Road. And that is a whole different, like a whole different webinar, uh, that something that we will definitely lecture on on the trip about the importance of the Silk Road, how magical it was. and so the, what, so we basically spend the first day exploring Xi'an, everything except the terracotta warriors, which we'll do the next day. And like this giant city wall, I mean, in, back in those days in China, um, you, you had to basically build a wall around the city to protect yourself from marauding tribes and this kind of stuff. So just you, you just got to think about humanity in a different dimension. It's a very vibrant city, and, and I've been to Xi'an a lot. 
So we've we've picked out um, the best places to spend the day, which my favorite part for sure is to go to the Muslim quarter um, at night. And that is the that's the original market that started the Silk Road. Great place for photography and just to just to understand in that whole theme of the Silk Road and what it is and what it means <clears throat> and how influential it's been is going to be a major theme in our trip is for for the cultural aspect. And and to be able to see, yeah, just the people, the culture, everything, and then learn a lot about the world and how it developed um, during, you know, from this very influential city. So we begin our trip in Xi'an. And of course, the highlight would be seeing the Terracotta Warriors. And we will, uh, yeah, we'll get a great view of them. We will go very early in the morning so that there'll be virtually uh, very, very few crowds there. And we'll have a, a good chance to spend the morning looking at one of the most amazing historical features on earth. Then from Xi'an, we travel by a bullet train down to Guanyuan in Sichuan province. Th then this bullet train, 150 miles an hour, it takes about three and four, three to four hours. Before the bullet train was made, you would have to, it's something like it would have been a 12 or 13 hour, uh, very tedious bus ride. But the, the this development of the bullet train really helped us achieve this itinerary, which would have been absolutely impossible, um, you know, before 2019. I don't know if anybody, you guys have been on a bullet train before, but it's pretty amazing. It's smooth, it's super fast. You can look out the window and just watch the landscape go by, cross mountain ranges, over cities, everything. And uh, in, in just this very comfortable um, setting. So it's actually my favorite way to travel because I can see things, but it's also just about as fast as an airplane. Then we go into Sichuan province, which is the jewel of China, which I believe Sichuan province is also one of the jewels in the world. It's basically um, <clears throat> a basin, a subtropical basin, a valley, which people call the kingdom of heaven because it's so fertile and the climate is such that it's just uh, been, been fantastic for agriculture, but it's ringed by some of the most incredible mountains in the world. And this would be an, um, you know, a good illustration of the, the, the agricultural ability. And basically, the Szechuan Basin is like a greenhouse with a diffuse light going through the mist, perfect temperature basically all year long, plenty of water, and uh, and people that have been there for five thousand years or more um, to to learn how to grow the best food on Earth. And that you know is incredible. So like, okay, here's a here's one example. When I go to my grocery store here in rural Arkansas, um, I might have a choice of maybe two or three edible mushrooms. In China, there's over 200 species of edible mushrooms. And you're going to, on this trip, we'll, we'll probably try as many as we can, as most of them. So just little things like that that you didn't really expect when you mostly just wanted to come see giant pandas. But it's like, wow, the, the food is incredible. The flowers, the landscaping. We're talking about ancient cultures that were just absolutely beautiful. And then we'll just see a lot of the place, a lot of the flowers um, that we that we we know from landscaping in North America. I mean, they all originate. A, a lot of them originate in China, <clears throat> which is pretty cool. So there's, I mean, just so much, so many different facets of this. And then there's the the history of China, and you can look at what they would call the <clears throat> say the old timers and look in their faces and look in their eyes as they look back at us feeling uh you know so, so happy to to meet people from america or the west or you know on our trips and then but if you if we understand chinese history it's incredible really i mean to think about if you know what they actually have gone through in their life and and, to, and just to learn about that of all the things that they have gone through. And now now that country has gone through some really difficult times is now in its golden age. So it's just a it's a great learning experience, great place for people photography to go into the villages and just travel our trips, we go places that other travel companies do not go and have never gone before. And I, I and I just very difficult to say that nowadays, but in China it's true. 
like we go to this one beautiful village right on the edge of the wilderness where we go into this national park to see wildlife and and then you can see this 2000 year old village that this creek running through the town with this gorgeous flowers and i you know and we explain this is the like basically the perfect example of like a feng shui where you have the water facing the building and then the mountain in the back and so yeah hard to explain in a tiny webinar where i'm trying to keep my time down uh but yeah so shinshi village one of my favorite places in the world really right at the right at the edge of this absolutely fantastic beautiful ecosystem that we will explore after that and the people there super happy to see us yeah we also stopped by we just basically this one of the things that we've kind of developed on this trip is we basically will just um on purpose just pick random places that look cool from 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 the road we'll get out we'll introduce ourselves as a, 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 a Ameri um, foreigners on a on a nature vacation um, expedition and and then and then watch these random people that had totally unexpected us show us around the village and that's that's the magical part i mean it's not set up it's not like we've contacted them in the beginning and said okay we're going to stop there at a certain time and here's money and you know i mean it's it's true it's true like travel that way that 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 i love and we just travel around and then learn we ask them and they just explain to them how do these rural villages look when you get outside of the 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 cities of china which seem futuristic and overwhelming to to westerners when you but when you go outside of the cities there's not um it's it's just basically rural residents that have these leases on the land for many many generations and so it is it is true old town you know individual farming plots and they have fantastic ways of you know being sustainable of making the most of, of their property and um and just living with the land and they've got the greatest hearts of anybody that i've ever seen in the world <clears throat> and this these kind of farming techniques that are ancient so it's not like giant corporate farms um, it's just small household family farms and just in, in small quaint villages um a, quite a utopia in my opinion Okay, so then we go back to the you know the nature. So we go into the mountains, into this nature reserve, and if you look at on our itinerary, I call it well, we called it the um, the wild panda, you know, uh, nature reserve. But because we don't actually want to publish exactly where it is, because we don't want too many people to go there too fast. It's a very undeveloped place that's not used to tourists, and it's delicate. And so I think um, it's just kind of one of our little secrets. And the only reason we're able to go there now is because in um, before 2008 earthquake, it would have taken probably 16 or maybe even 20 hours in a, on a really bad, bad bus trip, you know, ride. Then there was no accommodations. Um, but in 2008, this horrible earthquake happened in Sichuan, which I talk about a lot. <clears throat> and then after that, the government set aside a massive amount of money as a stimulus program to sort of improve the infrastructure of the rural areas. So one of the things was to improve the infrastructure of this of this nature reserve, and they built a a, a place to stay, and it's that we can stay in, and it's definitely not going to be um, five star accommodations um, according to you know normal natural habitat travelers, but it's it's good enough, and it's it's very very unique and interesting, and it's set in one of the this this very intact wild, highly protected ecosystem that i've just absolutely loved getting to know the rangers the the the, the people that run the like the, the the administration of the park and they're that they learning from us as as an ecotourism a company ways that they can better protect it and but also show it to people so it's been it's been awesome the rangers everything like that so this is when when we say wild panda <clears throat> we it's not like going to yellowstone with pulling up and watching, you know, wild pandas just off the side of the road eating bamboo or 
or even hike down a trail and just <clears throat> watch them like like I did for the last couple of months in Katmai with brown bears. You but you have to understand that if once you appreciate giant pandas, how elusive they are, how close they were to extinction, that just being in a place that has wild pandas is a magical experience. Even just being able to find their sign, like like I'm doing here, is a is an amazing experience. So uh, my point is, is that I do not want anyone to come on this trip with expectations that they're going to photograph um, giant pandas like we do brown bears and cat mice. And just it, it's impossible, but it, it doesn't happen. But the fact that this place is intact enough and well protected enough to have giant pandas in this day and age. The giant panda is the umbrella species that has allowed for the conservation of so much amazing wildlife, which we do have a chance to see, such as this wild tacken. And I did an entire webinar on all these animals, so I'm not going to go explain all this stuff. But this is just basically like a golden uh, mountain goat with a, you know, hybridized with an American bison. And uh, extremely endangered, but here, this is a, a, a sanctuary for the tack, and it's, we get to see these animals that most people never even heard of. Or the, you know, the monk jock, sorrel, goral, wild boar, Tibetan macaque, which is fantastic. It's basically um, similar to the snow monkeys of, of, um, of Japan, but it's a bigger, burlier, um, macaque that lives at high elevations in the mountains. And so, I mean, to see primates in, in like a alpine mountain environment is pretty, it pretty unique and pretty amazing, I think. I'm gonna start flipping through these pretty quick because I, I can just go on tangents all day long. So yeah, these are Tibetan macaques, beautiful. I mean, to see a beautiful woolly primate next to a gorgeous mountain river, uh, the rhesus macaque, possible chance of golden monkey, which we're gonna see actually up close and personal a little bit later in the trip. Amazingly enough, um, this is an animal where I never thought I would ever see in the wild, but we've, I think we have a total of 13 sightings of wild moon bear, Asiatic black bear um, in this park. And it's there getting more used to people on trails and, and losing their, their fear of people because they're so well protected in this park. I mean, I think that th these animals in this place Ironically, it's in China, probably the most well-protected animals in the world. And then there's all these other creatures that live in, the, basically like the foothill of the Himalayas in China. Um, Yellow-throated marten, hog badger, um, there's several kinds of, of civet, leopard cats, uh, incredible diversity of birds, such as this golden pheasant. Beautiful golden pheasant. And uh, I mean, for a bird lover, just to see one of these in the wild, it's, I mean, it's shocking. I mean, the, the, the brilliance of their plumage, it's unbelievable. Red-billed blue magpie, brown dipper, which is a bigger dipper than we have, um, but instead of eating on insects, it, it feeds the same way, but it actually catches fish underwater, which to me, I, <clears throat> the great tit, the hoopoe. One of my favorites is the red-billed leothrix. And uh, because you're in a humid environment, uh, very similar to the hills of Arkansas or the Appalachians, you got a very high diversity of um, amphibians and reptiles and beautiful snakes, gorgeous waterways. I mean, to me, it really feels like I'm in the like a very wild area of the Appalachians, but it's a lot wilder than the Appalachians. The the terrain is much steeper, much more dramatic but it still has that kind of temperate, high diversity feel. But then you also look into these bamboo thickets and realize that there actually are giant pandas there. Crystal clear waters, um, aquatic diversity, just the whole thing is just absolutely surreal to be in this place. It's this secret slice of Chinese wilderness. Oh, this is the red birch, it's beautiful. So yeah, for I mean, for landscape photography, for 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 botany, the whole thing, birds, everything. I mean, it's all there. It's just stuff that you never heard of. And so I mean, to me, it's 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 fantastic. And then uh, coming this coming in October, it's going to be in the fall. So we we do our trips in spring or fall. 
and people say, well, Brad, when's the best time to go on that trip? And I say, well, okay, you got to just answer a question. We do it in the spring and the fall. And what do you like better, gorgeous flowers or fall colors? And I've taken all the beautiful flower pictures out because this is directed towards the October trips. The flowers are incredible in the spring. Um, rhododendron, azalea, 33 species of um, native rhododendron in Szechuan. And they're all blooming and you got the red bud trees and all this stuff. However, the fall colors um, are, are fantastic because you have wild native um, you know, trees that are all turning beautiful yellow, um, such as the, the, well, I'm sorry, coolest tree in the world, the ginkgo. Yeah, you see, I mean, the way, there's one ginkgo tree that is, they estimate 2,500 years old in one of the original native ginkgo trees in the world. And we go see that. Um, also larches. Um, a larch is basically a coniferous deciduous plant so it's a, it's basically like a spruce tree or a pine tree but it turns beautiful yellow and it loses its needles in the fall so when they turn yellow the landscape just comes absolutely alive so this is stuff that we'll be seeing in october <clears throat> and then being in the fall that's going to go back to one of my key questions that i need to answer for this trip is what's the weather going to be like in both in the spring and the fall it's basically just like if you're going to go on a road trip to colorado What's the weather going to be like? Well, it depends what elevation we're at. And so we would go from basically sea level, where it's going to be nice and warm, all the way up to 10,000 feet, where it might be snowing. So it's one of those kind of places where you will have to pack for a variety of weather conditions. It's not going to be extremely cold. Um, might get down to 20 degrees at the coldest, at our highest, highest elevation. But you're going to need like a puffy jacket, um, a hat, gloves, things like that. And then as we're walking around, we're not going to be going on any like super crazy trails, but it'll all mostly be on boardwalks or, you know, nice pathways that are, that are, that are good, but you, you need some good walking shoes. Um, I would say maybe not like the full duty hiking boots, but something that you can definitely walk in, in, in all weather conditions in. So these are large trees in the, in the snow. Beautiful fall colors in the in the fall. I just I cannot wait to go back this in October. I've been every fall I just miss it because it's it was become kind of a thing in my life is to go see China in the fall. Beautiful fall colors, and then just you know these forests that have all kinds of exotic wildlife that we never know what we'll encounter around the next bend. So yeah, we're going to spend a couple days um, at that nature reserve, and then we're going to go down to another secret nature reserve to find uh, golden monkeys. They live there, and uh, they do get fed um, by the the government in order to, in certain times a year, in order to keep their survival rate high. Because one of the highest mortalities for the golden monkey is is basically starvation during the winter time. So they they keep those numbers boosted up. One of the most endangered primates in the world. So my favorite primate in the world, and I guide trips in Borneo where we're seeing pro, uh, proboscis monkeys, and orangutans, all these different primates, but my all-time favorite is the golden monkey. They're up like 7,000 feet. It's cool mountain panda country, and you have these beautiful, like with a blue face, I mean, these 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 golden monkeys. And if, you've, if you want to learn more about them, I think I, yeah, I, I did another webinar that was more focused on these guys. I can talk about them for a long time. Um, but another <clears throat> reason they became sem semi-famous was the amazing documentary that was done called Born in China. And um, yeah, I mean, to see these these monkeys. And one of the things that they're so cool is that they 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 hug. They hug each other in order to keep warm, but also for they have live in these like huge troops of different families. And basically, it's like a, a male that has maybe three wives and then the kids <clears throat> and there'll be just all these different families traveling together and in, in, in a sort of semi-organized unit so and then hugging is the way for them to all get along because there's a lot of jealousy that goes on with the males looking at the other wives and, and you know that kind of thing you can imagine how crazy stuff gets <clears throat> uh, fantastic primates
This is one of these uh, groups of, of a big family just giving each other a hug and staying warm on a cold afternoon in October. <clears throat> and then from there, <clears throat> we travel down to, to go visit our, our first panda reserve which is Dujayan Panda Base. It's got about a little over 30. And it's uh, kind of built as a, a quarantine base. Uh, so any pandas that in anywhere in the world in captivity are actually belong to China and they can only be over for a certain amount, like at least years. But when they return to China, um, they have to go into this, this base to make sure that they didn't pick up any diseases and things like that. Um, but they're in this beautiful reserve in the, in the foothills of the mountains where you've got gorgeous ginkgo trees and bamboo. And so I mean, basically the point is, is that we get to see lots of pandas. And uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, my dad, I thought pandas were amazing. My dad took me to Washington DC zoo and uh, to see the panda. And uh, it's like a thousand people there. And then the panda basically slept behind a bush and never really saw it. Here you're gonna get overwhelmed with the, not only to see a panda, how it acts, how it behaves, all the stuff it does, but mothers and cubs and big males and everything. So, and then for panda photography, it's it's incredible. And there are just tons and tons of happy pandas. So this will be our first kind of day watching pandas. No, it's not a, a wild panda, um, but they are in beautiful environment. And uh, we'll learn a lot about it and just get a tremendous amount of respect for giant pandas, red pandas. What we also do is a volunteer program. So we can actually go behind the scenes at this place, um, help them clean the, the pens of the pandas when the, of course the pandas will, will be moved out of there, but we'll have to do everything that the, that the caretakers do. We'll learn about how you care for pandas, which is 10 times more expensive and difficult than the next um, animal in captivity, which is the elephant. So there's me on the right. <laughs> cleaning up and we actually get a chance to do this it's so, yes and uh, many many times we have our travelers are in full on in tears because they get to be this close and, and up close and personal with what I already said was the <clears throat> maybe the most charismatic animal in the world then we travel up the mountains even further uh, because what the Chinese have done is built lots of tunnels under their mountain ranges. So what used to be a 20 hour drive to Wolong, um, very, very dangerous road. I, I have I have had done it before the tunnel. Now is a very easy, and then so boom, we go through long tunnels and then all of a sudden, bam, we're just in this gorgeous mountain panda reserve in the fall, fall colors, watching the best place ever for the <clears throat> photographing and watching these baby pandas in the nursery. and. And, and the thing is for photography aspect, <clears throat> um, what really makes it special is, you know, when, when I'm guiding photography trips, what I try to teach people is, you know, the most important, the, the, the background, what's in the background of the picture is just as important as the subject. So this place is where we can get beautiful backgrounds of natural, whether it's, you know, flower trees or, you know, fall colors. Or just a clean mountain background with these with these baby pandas that are they're climbing the trees. Then we keep driving further um, into the mountains to what the one of the in in it's basically kind of known as um, the Chinese Alps, but these mountains make the Alps look like foothills. Um, the valley bottoms where we'll be hanging out are, are at ten thousand feet, but the mountains around it are twenty over 20,000 feet. And so as we get up into this area, absolutely, totally different, high altitude ecosystem where we have Himalayan griffins. It's um, it's an area where there are snow leopards and Himalayan or uh, brown bears, Tibetan brown bears, um, th this kind of stuff. And then a very a Tibetan culture. And what I think is some of the greatest uh, scenery in the world. It's absolutely stunning and so unique and different. So if you like mountains, beautiful lakes. So we do spend some time exploring this area. And you can see it often <clears throat> in the spring or the fall, we can get you know light snowfall, cold in the mornings, 
nice in the afternoons, we can also get to know the Tibetan culture of the uh, of Szechuan. So when you when you say Tibet, you know, that's that's one area, but there's the the region of Tibetan culture is huge and it incorporates um, most of Szechuan actually. And like I said, it's the fan, most fantastic mountain scenery I've ever seen. I think uh, one of the things to make sure that you bring is is something to protect yourself from the sun. And because, uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're up at um, about ten thousand feet, and if, when the sun comes out, it's powerful. So, oh boy, am I getting excited looking at these pictures? It's a landscape photographer's dream, and so we just we just have a blast. It's gorgeous. Then we go do another stop at Dujoyan to photograph more pandas and, and see them again. So what's well, not truly wild, um, nothing really compares to pandas. Also red pandas. And we, we finished the trip in my favorite city on in the world, which is Chengdu, <clears throat> an ancient city with a, um, considered for many years as the highest quality of living in China. Um, laid back, I mean, fantastic. Now it's become very famous for people that are like foodies. Um, incredible history, just a really amazing vibe that is a is a perfect kind of balance between seems like a historical city to a, a city that seems like you've gone ahead, you know, 50 years as far as being futuristic. So that's where we finish our trip. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of the trip rundown, and I would just yeah. So Rob, would you uh, would you like to start any questions, or I can just keep talking? I've got a bunch of questions myself that I that I've tried to address um, so far. Yeah, Brad, we do have some questions, but before we get into it, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So let's get to some of these questions, shall we? So let's talk about the Panda Reserve for a second. Is Does it feel like it's a wild place or is it more like a, like the Sun Bear Reserve where it feels um, more uh, uh, man-made? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> the the panda breeding centers are going to be very very similar to the the sun bears in Borneo. So yes, it is. I mean, I can't. It would be similar to a zoo, but it's not a zoo. It's a place that is uh, set up to help breed pandas, their numbers. But as far as viewing them in a in a captive environment, it blows away anything that is available anywhere in the world. Now that now in the <clears throat> the nature reserve. The wild panda nature reserve that place is wild and um yeah there's wild animals everything's running free so you get you you get, you get a mixture however in that place the chances of seeing a, a wild panda they do exist we had we have had some sightings in the past of, of wild panda but they're incredibly elusive and uh, the chances of seeing them in that kind of thick forest where they're shy are, are very very small but if you blend the two together it makes for an amazing kind of combo Okay. Great, thank you. So can you talk a little bit about the physical requirements for the trip? What kind of shape I need to be in to come out to China with you? As far as physical, it's not difficult. Um, you do have to be able to spend um, you know, a night or two or at some time around 10,000 feet, but we've never had a problem with anybody. It's because it, mostly one of the tricks to staying good in high altitude as you as you acclimate and so we do gradually go to that elevation then we 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 do activities higher than we sleep so we've never had any problems with that but if you've been to 10,000 feet before and you immediately get mountain sick probably probably need to you know consider maybe it's not the the, the best trip <clears throat> there's no rigorous really tough hiking like we like you would have to do to go see the gorillas or something um i think that the number one thing is that people need to be travel hardy we we cover a lot of ground in a complex place 
to see lots of amazing stuff. So you do need to be able to have a lot, you know, one night stays in hotels, long bus rides, um, things like that, and just be able to roll with it because China is a place where just things pop up that we didn't foresee. And just to kind of say, well, this is part of the adventure. It is not, there's no way for, for us to do an expedition in these kind of places in China, like we do in Churchill, where everything, we've been doing it for so long, everything is just nailed down to a T and everything's so smooth. We're, it's not that kind of trip. We're going off into wild exotic places in a, in a you know, very exotic different country. So I think, you know, travel hardiness to be able to check into the hotel and have, you know, things that are just different and just say, well, that, wow, I'm, seeing something different you know i think i I think a lot of it's a a mental fortitude more than um, than the physical part um okay so would you say you would see more animals in the spring or the fall they're both uh, similar yeah i mean as i'm thinking back on all our trips i don't think that there's a real difference between which season is better again it's whether do you love flowers or do you love fall colors better that's pretty much the only difference between the two. Great. Thanks for addressing that. So you're saying it's pretty common to see um, red pandas and a lot of the different uh, animals that you've uh, shown us? The red pandas are again in kind of the breeding center. So they're kind of running wild in these big breeding, oh, oh, these big enclosures of like natural vegetation and stuff. So those would be the red pandas. We have had a few wild red panda sightings. Um, I think that the stuff that you would expect to see would be things like the giant or the um, the tacken, the golden pheasant, um, you know, animals like that. So, but like, you know, you know, it's a forest environment. So, it's like if you go to the Great Smokies and you want to see all the animals that live there, um, it's going to be difficult to see them because you're in the forest. You're not out on the savannas of Africa. So. You know, but but if you go, you, we will have some, always have had some cool sightings of some really cool stuff. So are do many of the people speak English on the trip or are there plenty of native guides to help explain things to us? Yes, yeah, we have, um, it would be like myself or the other, one of the other natural habitat expedition leaders, plus we'll have two locals. Um, we'll have a kind of a national guide and then we'll have an assistant. So, yeah, I mean, but definitely language is, is an issue uh, more than most places in the world. But like we've been doing this trip with fantastic success for a long time and, you know, we get around it. But yes, it's definitely going to be something where if you go down to the front desk to ask for something at some of these places, you're, you're not going to have somebody speaking English. But they're really good at like uh, learning how to, you know, do translator apps and things like that. So, you know, you just work through it and get along. It's okay. Go ahead. Uh, how is the air quality these days? If I have breathing issues, will I be okay? In Szechuan province, it's fantastic. And in, in most of the mountain areas that we, we go to are um, going to be the cleanest area you've ever seen. Um, we do start the trip in Xi'an. And so we'll have to say that depending on the way the wind's blowing at that time, um, yeah, it's you, you, it may be um, not great, but we're not going to be there for long enough to have any kind of um, bad effects. I mean, if you were going to be in Xi'an during 10 days that are bad, it would, you know, you might develop a, a bit of a, like a reaction, a little cough or something like that, but we're not going to be there long enough. And I think that probably from my experience, the the air quality in Xi'an is bad maybe half the time. It's not nearly as bad as Shanghai and Beijing and some of the other cities, you know, because you're, it's basically you're you're out west and the in the jet stream flows, you know, from west to east. And so you're not really getting so much of that kind of stuff that comes from the the coal factories and things like that. Okay. So do you recommend that we bring a tripod and do you have any recommendations for what kind of lenses we should bring? That's a a, a great question. And that really depends on the lens that that you're carrying if it's something that's like a huge lens that you need a tripod to hold steady yeah but in general like myself i never do um however we actually do provide tripods for people because sometimes if if somebody wants to say photograph waterfalls or something like that 
um, and they and they would like a tripod just for a few instances, um, we will bring some along. Um, <clears throat> I think that for me, I just don't. I mean, I I am able to use my big lens handheld and and do the best I can with it. So, okay, great, thank you. Um, so, how is the food on the itinerary? Can you talk a little bit about uh, the food? That's my favorite food in the world. Um, like I was uh, talking about when I was explaining Szechuan, the 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 amount for, the the amount the number of um, di like dishes you know uh, that you're going to eat because we would, how we how we eat there is we'll go to local restaurants only and and just local food, but not weird food. It, we never even go there, and it's not really available in that region of China. It's just like really fantastic um, Chinese food, but what makes it incredibly good is um, is the ingredients and all the different vegetables. And it is everybody that's ever been on the trip has said the the thing that I couldn't believe was how fantastic the food was. And we are definitely able to cater to um, any dietary restrictions because you're not going to be going to a restaurant ordering one you know dish. Say you're in somewhere in Wyoming and you. You can get a cheeseburger or you can get a chicken sandwich or whatever. This is so many different exotic dishes and it's mostly vegetables prepared different traditional ways. So I think that the food is going to be, it would be one of the highlights of the whole trip, regardless of who you are. Well, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> are there opportunities to actually touch a panda during the trip? Um, there used to be, but they ceased those kind of programs where you could have one, you know, sit next to one. But what we do is the best, um, the best alternative, which is the volunteer program. But while you can't touch it, um, you can basically put food in their mouth, which is, I mean, incredibly cool. So no, but you cannot like pet one or and, and things like that. I mean, it is a bear, even if they're in captivity, they're still a big bear. Good point. Um, so will there be any assistance to help carrying things like uh, camera equipment while we're out hiking or should i just have what i need i think we uh yeah i mean i guess that would be yeah we will i mean uh, we have basically have you will have three guides on the trip and so we will do the best we can to accommodate everything like as normal natural habitat trips go um but I think you'd have to uh, we'd, you'd have to ask specifically to your your uh, adventure specialist or concierge about whether or not you need a, a porter or something like that, which that would be negotiable whether we could arrange it or not. Great, thank you. So, is it possible to combine the China trip with a Borneo trip? Oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably would be. Um, because the seasons are, they, they, you know, they're, they're the same. So you could definitely do like a, I would say if you wanted to do that, you would probably do a, like a late April China trip. And then you can just go uh, to Borneo from there. And since you're already in Asia, it's possible. And I, I bounce back and forth between China and Borneo myself guiding. And it's, um, it's a, really, it's really cool. So yes, I, it would uh, be possible for sure. Go ahead. Great, thanks, Brad. Unfortunately, that's gonna be the last question that we do have for today. So I'm gonna throw it back to you for any more comments you would like to make for us today. Okay, um, I think that I'm just really happy that people have interest in this trip. Um, the US-China relations and whatever we look at as, as far as China goes, I, I wouldn't worry about that stuff or think about it. Just go there because I think every everybody should go visit China because it's a it's a, a civilization from 5,000 years. It's got some the most exotic wildlife in the world. It's got the greatest food. And the people when you when you realize like wow, these, I absolutely love these locals and these people and feel so welcomed. I mean, it's a euphoric travel experience that I don't think really can be compared. Um, with anything else it's just its own thing so if you want something different and you're adventurous and you're travel hardy and um, and you just want to learn uh, about a corner of the world that westerners don't go to this is the the, the the best trip to do and i'm just just super happy um that 
that they're running again. And then we can put our naturalist guides that we that are a part of our team back to work and um, and keep being good ambassadors um, and bridging these kind of gaps and learning from them and us teaching them stuff as well. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm just uh, excited. I can't wait. I mean, just looking through these pictures gets me very, very excited about it. Thank you guys very much. Brad, thank you so much for taking the time to present this amazing trip for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.